Hello everyone, my name is Vanessa Kwiatkowski and our presentation is on teaching the foundations of piano technique for a developing student. So what is technique? The origin of technique derives from an ancient Greek word techni, meaning of or pertaining to art, craft, or skill. Francis Clark described technique as the ability to bring the score to sound. This word is such a broad term for pianists, there are various different meanings, and the first thing that pops into mind is most likely a hand-in or charity exercise, or even scales. But this is not beginner technique. The foundation of technique includes physical motions, the use of large levers and small levers necessary to express musical ideas. Beginning students should be fully aware of the visual, the oral, and the physical aspects of playing the piano. This concept, however, can be confusing and difficult to include in lessons. In result, many teachers of young students avoid teaching technique at all. My focus is primarily to help teachers discover new ideas and activities to promote the development of technique with their students. In this presentation, I will include ideas from well-known pedagogues, which include exercises for healthy gestures and helpful instructions to develop artistry and tone. I will also introduce practical method books that help cover these topics. What are some problems we face today while developing beginner technique? First of all, there is not enough emphasis on the development of basic movements needed to play the piano. Often teachers fail to make the connection between the sound we create and the gestures we make. When this concept is not addressed, beginner students develop poor playing habits such as playing with tense, immobile hands. Students need to learn how and when to release tension when they're playing. With beginners, teachers rely on method books to supply technical concepts. And method books are wonderful tools, but they are just that, just tools. The majority of beginner method books place emphasis on note names, on rests, note locations, dynamic signs, and note values. This is very important information but the movements that students make in the first couple of years is equally important. In fact, these movements become habits for life. And next, dynamic symbols such as mezzo piano, mezzo forte, crescendo, diminuendo are introduced, but there are usually no guidelines provided to explain the touch or the movement necessary to make these dynamic changes. And often beginners, um, they start with finger number one, the thumb, but how are we supposed to use the thumb when playing the piano? And often we learn notes by using the legato five finger playing position. Uh, and this is great for learning notes. However, legato is one of the most difficult articulations to master. One major problem I find with method books is the use of intricate small levers, which is the fingers, while the large levers, such as the arms, the initiators of sound, are entirely ignored. The arm needs to be mentioned more in beginning books. In the initial stages of learning how to play the piano, students mostly are unable to read notes yet. So this is a perfect opportunity to demonstrate large motions to develop healthy technique. Now, what are the benefits of technique? If students are in control of their own playing, they gain confidence as musicians and eventually have the opportunity to become independent pianists in the future. Beginners need to create good playing habits and the development of artistry is vital. Nighthouse once said, quote, working on artistic image should begin at the very first stage of learning the piano and note reading. If a child is able to reproduce some very simple melody, it is essential to make this first performance expressive. And how we play matters. Piano playing is much more than just pressing the right notes. As piano teachers, we need to make sure we instill a love of music in our students. Therefore, we need to make sure we teach technique for the purpose of making beautiful music. Now next is injury prevention. Here's a picture of a student playing with poor technique. You can see her fingers are very tense, her hands are tense and her fingers are collapsed. Often when we discuss injury-free playing, we talk about advanced pianists. So where does this leave us with beginner students? It's not too often we reach this level, so why should we worry about that? However, waiting to teach healthy technique at the intermediate and advanced levels is way too late. At that point, we have to retrain our students' bad habits, and this can be very frustrating. Sometimes students even quit because of this. 
There is a large number of injured pianists, especially in undergraduate programs where the amount of practice time and the difficulty of repertoire is increased. Playing related injuries are actually found in youth, collegiate, and professional pianists. A survey cited in the Journal of Music Performance Research showed that of 505 respondents, nearly 72% of professional musicians and 38% of non-professional musicians reported musculoskeletal injuries. These overuse disorders include hand and wrist pain, numbness, weakness in fingers and the arms, neck pain, shoulder pain, tendonitis, and more. I'm sure many of the pianists in the room right now can relate to these injuries. So how do we teach technique? It's important for teachers to be aware of the physical aspects of piano playing and know how to teach this effectively to young students. The first task is to establish healthy posture at the piano. Here's a picture of a pianist with poor posture. So you know it's Glenn Gould. Uh, he's sitting way too low. He has a very curved back and gray shoulders. And now here is a good picture of posture. It's actually from the favorite book. Notice how the student is seated at a level where their arm is horizontal with the floor. And notice um, the distance that they're actually at. The distance right here. Uh, I usually like to ask my students to reach out their arms and have their knuckles touch their fall board. That way they're not seated too closely. Also notice that the student has feet flat on the ground. This is very important. Often we have young students who come into lessons and their feet are dangling. And it's important to have a footstool or a pedal extender for them to make sure they're supported uh, with their feet. And actually to make sure that they're using their weight on their sitting bones, I like to ask students to stand up without using their arms. And sometimes students like to sit like this at the piano, so Marvin Blickenstaff actually recommends uh, for teachers to ask their students to sit tall. Uh, sometimes when you ask them to stand up straight, they become tense in their shoulders. And he also has them, at every lesson, he has them raise their shoulders to their ears and then relax their shoulders. That way they can get used to this feeling of relaxation. One problem is that often students sit way too close to the piano, and this creates the immobility to move freely across the keyboard. So don't be afraid to set, to set aside time at the beginning of the lesson to get the height of the bench exactly right. And you can also ask uh, parents to take pictures of their children seated at the piano at home. Sometimes you can be shocked to see how bad their posture is at home. Now the first playing mechanism is the large levers, the arms. Julie Nurr said, quote, the arm is the main playing mechanism at the beginning of study. The ability to move freely on the keyboard is one of the most important aspects in developing technique. Equally important is the development of control of the large playing units. These include the upper arm, the forearm, and the wrist. I will briefly describe the levers we use to play the piano, followed by practical ways to incorporate these motions in lessons. One technique pianists use is arm weight, which is also known as the free fall gesture. The fall of the arm transfers energy and weight through the wrist into the firmly shaped fingers. Finger touch alone cannot produce large sounds, nor can it produce a warm, rich tone. Uh, we need the support from our arms. So how do we demonstrate this to our students? One option is to have a student hold the soft ball and to actually just press it against the keys and they can actually just feel the motion of their arms on the keys. And this is excellent because they don't have to worry about their fingers just yet. Another exercise from the piano is to have the students press their fingers into a yoga ball. This is also a good motion for them to feel their arm weight. And they can even do finger push-ups against the wall, where they actually just press up against their body weight right there. Now, exercises away from the piano are very important because kids can easily do these movements. And then, when they go to the piano, they can transfer these movements to the keyboard. Julia Nur says, I find myself more and more moving away from the piano, briefly to teach technique when possible, so that the focus is solely on one skill at a time. If there is no sound to be made, they can focus on my instructions. And then Bastian also recommends that the students support their third finger with their thumb. Uh, so often students when they play, their nail joints collapse. So if you support the thumb, 
support the third finger with your thumb, then you can drop into the notes with a strong fingertip. Next, to feel the motion of free fall, movement of the whole arm, the teacher can lift the student's arm and move it around without any resistance from the student. Then you can allow the arm to fall into the other hands. And here, physical contact is necessary between teacher and student. The teacher has to see if the student is playing completely relaxed. And also, just a friendly reminder to please make sure you ask your student and the parents before you end up touching the student's arms. We also use the arm in float off movements, like at the end of the phrase. Uh, to do this motion, the wrist must be gradually raised until the finger leaves off the key. You can use the analogy of an airplane lifting off the ground or a bird flying from its nest. And now here are some exercises to teach free, relaxed arms. Nighthouse makes the students let one arm drop lifelessly and then having the other arm pick it up and repeat. The simple exercise is actually very difficult for some students. They don't want to let go of their arm. They're, they're very cramped up. The next exercise is the weeping willow tree. And in this picture, you can notice that the arms are supposed to imitate the, the leaves swaying from left to right. You can imagine, tell the students to imagine that their arms are the branches and that their body is the trunk. The next exercise is the big bird exercise. And for this one, you can imagine, ask your students to imagine that their arms are moving up and down just like the wings of an eagle. And next is the floating arms. Uh, you can ask your students to imagine they're swimming in the water and their arms are just floating on the water. This next one, the marionette exercise, is supposed to imitate the puppets where the students fall off their arms straight and then they bend their fingers and their hands, their forearms, and then their arms. And you can also do this with music. And this is really great for students to realize that they have so many different joints here. And the last one is the hanging bridge exercise. So Nyhaus compares the arm as a hanging bridge connecting the shoulder to the fingertip. He makes the students swing the bridge slowly while keeping the fingertips on the keys. And Irina Gorin calls this the monkey swing, and she actually uses a monkey toy to, I can't really imitate this right now, but the monkey toy is supposed to just wrap around the wrist right here, and it's supposed to swing with the arm. And then next, the kids love that one. The next one is the forearm. Now the forearm is used primarily in a rotation movement, uh, and this is necessary to play skips or larger leaps. Rotation is also used whenever the notes in a series move back and forth like the Alberti bass or broken octaves. Uh, when I was a high schooler learning Beethoven Pathetique in the first movement, uh, there's like this tremolo of octaves in the left hand, and I was always so tense I could never make it through the first, through the first <laughs> movement. Uh, you can also use the analogies of jiggling a doorknob, opening and closing the lid of a jar, or tightening a screw with a screwdriver. When you first start learning this exercise, um, make sure you exaggerate your motion, so really, really rotate your arms. And then eventually you can start minimizing the rotation, so the rotation is less obvious. Marvin Blickenstaff has the students practice this exercise with the fingers away from the piano. He has them play 1-3, 1-3, 1-3, then 2-4-2, two, two, and 3-5-3. Three, three. And eventually, he puts words to it, saying rock the hand to play the skips, and the fingers play the steps. It's an interesting exercise away from the piano. All right, and then next is the wrist. The wrist is one of the most important aspects in our ability to play the piano. It helps us move from one note to the next, it helps us play staccato, two-note slurs, and it also acts as a shock absorber of our arm length. The wrist is also known as the flexible bridge between the arm and the hands. For students' development of wrist motions, Marvin Blickenstaff says, have the student pick up an imaginary glass water and just slowly tap it in slow motion. Notice which part of your arm is being used. Next, have the student knock on a table saying, Knock, 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 anybody home. And this is a good rhythmic exercise too. You can say quarter, 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 eighth, and eighth, and half. Bastion places emphasis on the wrist and calls it the down, up wrist motion. 
He connects us to playing slurs and connects us to playing phrases. When students that students have, one problem that students have is that they play with really low wrists. If this is a problem, then you can always have them stand at the piano and play, and that way their wrists aren't collapsed. Another problem is that they play with very tense wrists. Our, our wrists generally need to stay loose and flexible so that we can transfer the power from our arm to the fingers. And here's a video of Irina Mitz. She teaches in German um, and she teaches in Russian. So <laughs> we won't be able to understand her, but here you can see her working with a student to work on flexible wrists. Okay, so here are some additional flexible wrist and breathing exercises. Uh, students don't know what flexible wrists are, so we need to make sure we do some more exercises with them. Naya House has the students practice vertical up and down motions with the wrist, um, and also it's recommended to really try and raise the wrist slowly so the fingers hang down loosely. And then as you play another note, you can have the wrist uh, just fall all the way down and then in slow motion just practice that over and over. Each movement should be very slow and without tension. You can also practice um, breathing wrist raises, and here's an example of an exercise. So you're playing a sixth, and you just practice moving your wrist up and down. And at the end, there where the rest is, you can practice taking a breath, and you can ask your students to imagine breathing in, um, like a big breath of air, or imagine smelling a beautiful flower. So that way they, they're breathing while they're playing. And then next, you can also use an elastic hair bands, and you can put your hand through there and just have the student completely relax their hands. That way they know that what it feels like to play without tension. It's also very important to make sure that your wrists are aligned for the most part. Um, usually when students sit too close to the piano, their hands, they twist out in different directions. And if they play like this for too long, then this creates tension and overuse of the forearm muscles. So how to teach technique for the hand. Isabella Vingarova actually regarded the position of the hands to be of the utmost importance in piano technique. And although it is important to establish the so-called hand position in, in the beginning, keep in mind that the hand has to change shapes to accommodate the music. But to achieve in the beginning the natural hand shape, I like to ask my students to relax their arms at their side. And then when you lift your arm, you will find a perfectly shaped hand. You can also ask your students to put their hand on a bent kneecap, or you can ask them if their hands start to, their fingers start to play flat, you can ask them to make a muffin and not a pancake. Uh, but with beginner students, I just like to have them put fists on the keys and then to slowly pull their fingers out. Uh, because sometimes when we say, hold a softball, um, this can create tension. Uh, so sometimes Irina Mintz actually mentioned 
to say, picture holding a tiny baby bird. You can hold it, but you don't want to squeeze it. And next, Schopen actually used the B major scale to demonstrate the most natural state of the hand and fingers. He would place the thumb at the E right here and put all three fingers up here, up on the black keys, and then our pinky here. And this creates actually the natural hand shape as well. Another tip is to ask the student to become the teacher. You can show like an inadequate hand position where your fingers are flat or you're very tense, and you can ask the student to correct it. And here is one way, here's a picture of showing how to correct the wrist, the hands. And the hands are very important in supporting the arm weight. They need to be strong to support that weight. Uh, it is difficult to teach this concept to children, so do not explain what I exactly just said in technical terms. Instead, have them do this exercise. For feeling the weight transfer, have them place their hands on the keys, and then to support the weight of your hand, I would suggest putting a little bit of pressure with your fist on the student's hand, and that way they don't collapse their hands. One problem we often find is collapsed knuckle bridges. This is where the knuckles completely collapse here. And this is this makes it hard to actually support the weight of the arms. So here is actually on the left side a very good shape for supporting the arm. Now, um, sometimes to release tension in the hands, you can ask the students to squeeze a stress ball and then release the hands. Explain that this is basically releasing tension. And then next we have the small levers, the fingers and the thumb. Each finger is different in length and shape, four of them are similar, and the thumb is different in structure, so it needs special attention. The thumb is opposing and it moves alongside the hand. The work of the fingers is very important. They need to be the strong pillars for the weight of the arm. It is important to teach the students from the large motions down to the smaller motions because these fingers need to support the arms. One common mistake that pianists use is just using the fingers alone, and pianists sometimes call this finger strength, but this is actually an inaccurate description of what is actually happening mechanically. The fingers and hands are actually supporting the weight of the arm. Relying on fingers alone causes overwork in the forearm muscles. This can cause a lot of tension. One problem we have with beginner students especially is flying fingers. They'll play one note and their other finger flies up. When the pinky flies up, it's not the pinky's fault. You can correct it, uh, but this means that the student is just using the finger muscles instead of letting the arm do the work. These fingers actually signal excess tension, so just when the pinky's up, just touch it and make it relax. Always remind your students to relax their hands. And then often when the thumb is not the finger playing, their thumb goes out like this and it's super tense. So Julie Nury recommends to gently move the student's thumb up and down to see if it moves easily. If it's tense, you can ask the student to pretend that the thumb is asleep and let it go. And then just keep working on this over and over. So here is a picture of collapsed knuckles here, small joints. Now how to fix or identify our collapsed small joints. You can ask the students to make O's with their fingertips. This is actually in the uh, favorite books. And then when they make an O, you can actually push on their nail joints and see if they collapse. Uh, and this actually exercise is really good for developing strong finger fingernail joints. Uh, Julia Nora also likes to tell their students to imagine they're hanging off a cliff with their fingertips. And just like mentioned earlier, you can do the finger push-ups. You can practice pushing your fingers into a yoga ball. Then they know how to play with the fingertips and support their arm weight. And here are some nail joint exercise. We have the Curious Woodpecker. <laughs> with this woodpecker, uh, you can see the <laughs> woodpecker tapping to the tree. It's kind of like our fingers tapping on the piano. Uh, so you can use that analogy with your students. And then you can also practice tapping the rhythm with your fingertips off of the keyboard. And actually, here's the video. Um, let's see if this mouse works. Another video of Irina Gorin. They're actually Irina Mintz with this one. And, uh, they're practicing singing a German folk, t folk song, and you can see them tapping the rhythm with their fingertips. Jetzt geht's schön rund schlagen, ja? Atmen, 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 atmen
Mund. Köppchen in das Wasser. Schwänzchen in... Ist das gut so? Oder schön gut? Ja. Schwänzchen in die Höhe. Wow, weißt du, ich kann... Okay, now that we are aware of the different movements that we need to play the piano, uh, let's discuss some of the method books that really help develop technique. The first one here is Piano Safari by Julie Nur and Catherine Fisher. Now, method books are exceptional resources to aid piano teachers in the introduction of various technical gestures. When searching for sound method books which promote healthy technique, I look for methods which started with the larger movements and eventually progressed to smaller movements. The PS Safari method book teaches basic motions through animal themed exercises, and here is a list of the animal themed exercises. Now, Joy Moore posted a review of PS Safari in her blog, which states It is so beneficial for students to have a simple exercise piece where their entire focus can be on developing the basic hand motions that are fundamental to make beautiful sounds at the piano. These technical exercises are taught by rote to allow students to concentrate solely on their gestures and avoid being distracted by the score. And here's a video, if I find the rules. Here's a video of Catherine Fisher, who is the co-author of Piano Safari, introducing these movements. And actually, here's, uh, I brought one of the method books in case you would like to flick through it after the presentation. Uh, but the next method book that I will discuss is Tales of Musical Journey by Irina Gorin. Now, this method is written in the form of a chapter book and uses a fairy tale story to introduce musical concepts. 
There's also an excellent teacher guide book that comes along with the method book and explains how to teach technique. This book begins with Nalinato examples uh, on finger number three to develop a strong, beautiful tone with the use of the arm. Non-legato is the foundation of healthy piano playing. Students focus on artistry and tone production from the very first melodies. These are accompanied by directions on how to play with our arms, how to release the key, and float with their wrists in the direction of the next key. Irina utilizes the rainbow exercise uh, to demonstrate this breathing wrist motion with every phrase. Now this exercise is taught by rote, and it's just, you're basically just making a rainbow just with your wrist. Finally, there are many European folk melodies which help build the student's artistry. Nighthouse believes believe that if a child is able to reproduce a simple melody, they should be able to do so expressively. For this purpose, he advises the use of folk tunes, which evoke the emotions and musical playing. And here's a video of Irina Boren teaching the student. Actually, the second book, the other book my students are borrowing, but you're more than welcome to look through these books. Uh, the next one we have is Succeeding at the Piano by Dr. Helen Marley. This next method book, um, it's a great aid in helping students work on develop healthy technique. Before the pieces are played, there is usually an introduction or a review section that helps students remember which gestures to use and which movements they should be focusing on. The first gesture is called Drip Drop Roll, which is um, it helps the students realize their free arm, their weight transfer, and flexible wrists. And now to do this one, students lift their arms and let their fingers hang down and pretend that water drips through their fingertips to their thighs. And now the next one, they have to actually just drop their arm, and then after that, they have to make sure they roll onto their fingertips. The next one is the woodpecker, which is used for staccato touch release gestures. The next one is tissue box. Uh, this gesture requires students to play a note and imagine pulling a tissue from the tissue box when they lift off. Uh, you can find a picture of a tissue box at the end of phrases in the books. Next is push off, which is a touch release uh, for faster pieces when you want to play a short, crisp sound at the end of the musical pattern. And then Hel Dr. Helen Marley actually used the image of a kangaroo in her music. So imagine a kangaroo is pushing off or kicking off. Uh, this one helps the students follow through with their arms. And then finally, she has rebound staccato and portato, which are both articulations mentioned in the books. Now next is the Shock Technique book, How to Improve Your Tone and Technical Skills at the Piano by Carolyn and Jamie Shock. And now, here's actually the Succeeding at the Piano book, and then here is the Shock Technique book. So you're more than welcome to look through those too. Okay, now this is not necessarily a method book, but it is a great supplementary book for technique. All of the exercises are based on physical and sound related concepts called principles, and there are seven principles. The first one is arm as a unit. With this principle, students feel the whole arm between, behind each gesture. The exercise mentioned is the use of an eraser and of a pencil to play on the piano keys. 
Now with this one, so just imagine you're holding a pencil and you just press the, uh, the erasers into the keys and you can feel the entire arm. Uh, students feel the whole, their whole arm, hands, and pencil acting as one long finger. They can also feel the follow-through motion as, they, as though they were hitting a baseball in slow motion. And next is grouping. In the alphabet, the section where we say LMNOP, it's very quick. And this is an example of shaping a group of notes with direction. It helps give the notes more meaning. The next one is rotation, which we already talked about. You can use the analogy of a doorknob and a jar. And notice that your elbow is not supposed to move when you uh, use rotation. Next one is letting go, which refers to the arm weight we need to feel. Uh, one exercise is to actually use a sock, a very long sock as a sling, and you can rest your arm on it. To make a beautiful tone at the piano, we need to let go of the tension in the arm. So you can ask your students to think of a sleeping baby, so relaxed. The students fully relax when the sock feels heavy. If they're not relaxed, the sock will feel light. Next one is follow through. Uh, this exercise is to release arm tension. And one exercise is to practice throwing a dart and just imagining you're just following through with that one. Next one is rebound and up motion. This is used for st staccato articulations. And you can use a ping pong ball to bounce off the floor as an example of playing staccato. And when you bounce it off the floor, you can notice the quick uh, and bright sparkling sounds. Finally, arm behind each finger. When you are walking, uh, be aware of your body weight shifting from one foot to the next foot. This is the same with our fingers as well, when they move from one note to the next note. The arm travels with them and improves the quality of each sound. Julie Nair made a review of this book and said, these books provide the perfect opportunity to develop hand and thumb position, work on strong finger joints, learn to feel the arm behind each note, use their wrist appropriately, practice the study beat, and listen to their tone quality. I feel this time to develop solid foundation technique apart from the reading process is critical. So next we have instructions and activities to promote healthy technique. Did you know that when you describe how something tastes or look at a picture of food, certain parts of your brain light up? This can be a very helpful tool for teachers to introduce new concepts and connect to something that the student already knows, such as the taste of pizza. Francis Clark once said, teaching is not telling. The golden rule is um, when teaching a new concept, you want to proceed from the known to the unknown. For example, a student might not know what their knuckle bridge is, but they could be excited about the possibility of a small animal such as a mouse fitting underneath their knuckle bridge. Often teachers spend too much lesson time explaining concepts. Young children have low attention spans, therefore teachers must have clear goals with precise minimal language. Avo like avoid explaining how to play, instead you can just demonstrate and ask the student to repeat what they heard. In her books, Dr. Helen Marley compiled a list of 18 confusing, harmful phrases to avoid, followed by a list of positive examples to use while teaching technique. Now, Dr. Marley teaches the Piano Pedagogy Certificate Program for undergraduate piano majors uh, at Grand Valley State in Michigan and she teaches the program for professional piano teachers, so she has most likely heard many of these confusing or harmful statements. Uh, and then here she compiled a list of helpful phrases to use. Here's an example of a, just one example from her list. Um, play with the straight back. Sometimes this causes students to tense up, so instead you can ask them, play with a back that is long and tall. Or instead of, you're too tense, relax, sometimes the students tense up even more. So you can ask them, close your hand tightly in a fist and then release. Um, and also with younger students, sometimes it's boring to say, play louder here. So maybe you can come up with a story as to why the student will be playing loudly. Maybe they really want their pizza. Next is the use of nonverbals. Teachers can use nonverbal cues such as demonstrating, the proper handshake, or even adjusting the student's hand quickly. Imitation is also another effective way to teach. Uh, we have monkey see, monkey do, and this is where the, um, so the teacher shows something and the student just imitates right afterwards. Finally, the incorporation of analogies and metaphors. Uh, the technique necessary to create different sound qualities is so easy to teach when musical creativity is the primary goal. 
We play the piano first using the mind and the ears, then with the hands. We can use analogies and metaphors to spark creativity. Rachmaninoff supposedly used the analogy of the fingers growing into the keyboard. If a student is working on a variety of pieces with different characters, ask them which animal is playing this certain articulation. Then ask the student to communicate um, these characteristics with sound rather than with words. So you can ask them, tell a story with your fingers. Now Anton Rubinstein once said, the piano is not a single instrument, but a hundred. It is very helpful to remind your students of an orchestra and what the instruments sound like. For example, you can ask your student, which part could be played by a violin? Um, and now in order to achieve our technical goals with students, we must enter the world using concepts they know. Next, we have tone production. And Nighthouse quote said, said quote, uh, since music is a tonal art, the most important task, the primary duty of any performer is to work on tone. Teachers need to work on the development of the student's ear, their imagination, and capability to listen to themselves. The ability to make a sound of piano is very easy. You just have to press, press the keys, right? But the ability to make a beautiful sound is difficult. So by training students' ears, we directly influence their tone. Nighthouse recommends teachers to work on tone in this pattern. Number one, first talk about the image, the meaning, the content and expression, what the piece is all about. Second, work on the embodiment of the image to the music. And third, talk about technique as a whole to master the muscular movements of the performer. One way to work on tone is to discover the limits of the piano with your student. Discover new gradations of tone. Our hands are capable of extracting the most varied tones and colors from a piano. Here's an example from the Shock Technique book where the student actually plays a C scale very musically, starting from three pianos going all the way up to three fortes. And the directions underneath the scale mention the analogy of walking up a staircase. If the hand falls too slowly at the three piece, there's no sound that's created. But if the hand hits the piano too quickly and harshly, we create noise, which is the max limit for the piano tone. Even with a young beginner student, you can take one note and have them play the single tone in so many different ways. You can express feelings such as tenderness, anger, sadness. This can help awaken the student's curiosity. The use of different words to describe moods such as joyful, gloomy, skippy can be very helpful in achieving different touches to the piano. In this case, the student doesn't need to know exactly how to play a note. They can just imagine a mood and play the note accordingly. According to Joseph Levine, the cultivation of a singing touch, which is the use of arm weight, should be part of the daily work of every student. Uh, you can use the analogies. It's like sinking into the key or going through butter. Um, I like to tell my students to imagine they're playing to the very bottom of the piano. Next, lend your ears to your students. Franz Liszt believed the first task of any musician was to learn how to listen. Often kids only listen to the first sound and do not listen to the decay of sound. And on the topic of playing loudly, sometimes when beginner students try to play a loud note, they turn to stone. They try very hard to play a loud note and they tense up. And as a result, they play a harsh sound or even a weak, thin sound. So students need to hear the difference between a beautiful tone and a harsh tone and relate this to their movements. Finally, it is important to note that work on tone is a means and not the purpose. Now, relating this to articulations, to play the piano well, we need the ability to produce many different sounds. And the first articulation is non legato. This is the foundation of piano playing uh, because this motion supports the use of the entire arm. To practice non legato, we talked about the rainbow exercise mentioned earlier, where you use your wrist to guide you from one note to the next. The next one is two note slurs. To work on this, drop into the key with the slight lower wrist motion and then release with the higher wrist motion. Also, the first note of a slur should be louder than the second one. So one exercise you can do with your students is have them play the very first note and then wait until the sound dies off and then only play the second note once the first note ends. Um, and here's an example of a two note slur uh, exercise from the Shock Technique book. The directions at the bottom ask for students to play with a slow, cushy, 
landing on the first note, just like an astronaut landing on a distant planet. It also says to describe this motion with two note words, such as sighing, crying, or yearning. Uh, and often you can ask if your student has a two-syllable name, you can say Sally, Susie, just names like that. I like to ask my students sometimes to even pick up the key and put it in their pocket. Really exaggerate these motions uh, to make sure students can grasp the idea. Next we have staccato. The best way to play staccato is to prepare near the key and push up, rather than dropping from a higher point and rebounding. In Tales of a Musical Journey, Irina uses a frog toy, just like this one right here, and she places it on the student's wrist, and then she has them just jump up. <laughs> and this is a good way to demonstrate staccato. And you can also tell your students that staccato is very similar to knocking on a door. The wrist is flexible, but it's not flabby, so you can't knock on a door like this. Um, and away from the piano, you can have some exercises, um, just like I mentioned earlier, using ping pong balls. Notice how fast they jump up, just like our hands, we should be jumping up as well. Next, we have legato. Chopin stressed that legato touch was the most important touch in piano playing, but it is also one of the most difficult. Uh, so some metaphors you can use for legato playing is an example of a person walking. One foot comes down, the other goes up, and the process is repeated. Or imagine you are on a seesaw with your friends. So one person goes down, the other person goes up. Joseph Levine actually asked the students to imagine the notes in a legato phrase to be compared to a string of beads. They're all very similar. Uh, you can make the student step away from the piano and then sing a phrase. Notice that there are no breaks when playing. It is important for students to hear or model these sounds uh, before playing them, so I recommend teachers to demonstrate both the sound and the technique. This leads us into phrasing. Um, a slur means not only to play legato, but to watch out for a nice phrase ending. Fashion suggests that the end of a phrase should be compared to a singer taking a big breath at the last note of a phrase. At the piano, the breath is taken when the hand is lifted and the line is broken. I would recommend to work on phrasing by singing the melody with direction. The notes should not all be the same volume. To sing a real cantabile legato, the notes should have direction. And we have voicing, which is also another important technique for pianists to make sure the melody is louder than the accompaniment. One way to work on this is to practice ghosting, and this is when one hand plays the melody while the other hand hovers over the accompaniment, but doesn't actually make any sound on the keyboard. Another exercise is to have the student walk away from the piano and step on their right foot while tapping their left foot so they can feel the weight on one foot. Uh, you can also use spoons to help students voice better. Use a metal spoon, which is heavier in your right hand, and a plastic spoon in your left hand, and you can feel the weight difference between those. And finally, the conclusion. Just a quick re recap. Pianistic technique is a skill and ability to project musical ideas using a keyboard as the means of communication. In summary, the elements of a solid elementary level piano technique are proper posture at the piano, relaxed shoulders and arms, freedom and confidence of movement all over the keyboard, flexible wrists, malleable hand shape, strong nail joints, and the development of one's imagination. And then here are some recommendations for teachers interested in learning even more about beginner technique. I would recommend to attend conferences. The very first conference I attended was in 2016, and I watched Irina Gorin give a, give a presentation on this topic, and I was so interested right away. Uh, then next, read more books on technique, and I have a really long bibliography, so you can use that to find some extra books. Uh, next, join groups, whether it's on Facebook or your local, local group. Um, there are Facebook groups such as Tales of Musical Journey or there's Irina Mintz, she has a group. Um, and you can also watch videos of other teachers teaching and that's how I discovered some of the videos that I use today. Next, use hands-on toys in your studio. Uh, these are good because um, you can have students hold on to these and you can have them figure out how to, how to shape their hands. And also students like to be busy with their hands, so the more toys, the better, actually. In an attempt to ensure that technique is a part of each day's practice routine, 
Marty Blinkenstaff places warm-up drills at the top of his students' homework. He also starts each lesson with these drills to ensure that the students are doing this at home too. Sometimes uh, it's important to note that technique comes naturally to students. Uh, on many occasions we have students who naturally just play well. They're using very flexible arms, wrists. Um, at this point there's no need to tell a student to change much. To avoid confusion, the student most likely does not need to hear how to do it. They're already doing it. Next, parents play a huge role in their child's musical studies. 30 minutes of lessons won't be enough to correct a week's worth of unhealthy practicing at home. So talk to parents about being extra vigilant at home. It is best if one of the parents is present during the lessons. The best results are achieved when the parents are on board and work with you in order to have successful outcomes from piano lessons. And finally, be consistent. Your little students will understand the importance of hand position when you begin weekly with these activities and make it a priority. And you can't expect the students to get this all at once, so this is, it happens over time. Just friendly reminders, if their fingers are flying up, you can always tell them to relax their fingers. Be patient and it will come eventually. And final thoughts. My hope is that everyone in this room found at least one new idea to incorporate in their studio. It is important to remember that the results will not be achieved immediately. It is a process of development. Finally, while it is important to start technique from the beginning, please remember that technique should not be the end all for piano playing. The goal for piano teachers is to instill a love for music and playing with healthy technique for, uh, piano for students can help bring students closer to their music. And that is all. Thank you.